Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Skidmore. I'm the director of the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. Thank you for uh, joining our today's webinar, which is um, funded by a grant from the USDA. It's a rural health and safety uh, education grant. Um, and so this is co-sponsored with Purdue University and the NCRCRD. Um, today we have uh, a webinar focusing on the demand side factors uh, influencing uh, drug use in, in America, again, focusing on the opioid crisis. Um, that's been the focus of this webinar series. Uh, so we know that the drug epidemic has become one of the most devastating public health crises of the past century. Um, and so uh, this webinar um, is focusing on some of the de demand side factors that have helped to spur uh, the crisis um, in in November. Um, Rosa, would you? So today's webinar is, is Michael Betts, and I will introduce him in just a moment. I just want to remind everyone that we also have another webinar uh, later on in the year on December 7th. Um, Sam Quinones, a journalist and author of Dreamland, um, will be talking about the supply side uh, factors that have uh, spurred the crisis as well. So th keep those two on. Um, you know, this one today and then also the December 7 uh, one on your calendar. Okay, thanks, Rosa. All right, so uh, I'd like to introduce Michael Betts. Um, Michael, thank you for being here. P Michael is a, an assistant professor in the Department of Human Sciences and is a FCS state specialist at The Ohio State University. Um, Michael uh, Betts' research focuses on how local economic conditions uh, um, impact a wide range of individual, family, and community well-being indicators. And right now, he's focusing on um, um, the opioid crisis. Uh, Michael, um, this is not in his bio, but you may be interested to know that he was the goalie for the Ohio State University hockey team back in the day. So that's an interesting factoid for you as well. So with that, um, I will tell you that um, you can, uh, if you have some questions or comments, you can use the chat section and Michael may answer them uh, along the way or wait till the end. And so with that, I'll introduce Michael. Michael, thanks a lot yeah, for being lot. here. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, and the, the first question I always get asked when people hear that is, are your teeth real? And uh, given that we don't have any video today, you guys are just going to have to take my word for it that I do have all my teeth and I'm smiling at you right now. So um, anyway, thank you, Mark, for inviting me to be a part of this webinar. Um, this is a, a really a, a fascinating topic that uh, has so many factors that are influencing it. Um, and it, it, it's impacting such a wide range of, of people that uh, so many academics have started to do research on this, and, and that's partly why I wanted to get into this as well. Um, I, as Mark said, my background is in regional economics and, and looking at why certain parts of the country are doing well and other parts aren't doing so well, and, and what are the factors causing those things, but also how those things then turn into you know real-life uh, factors that impact people's lives and their well-being and their health and, th and, and so on and so forth. So um, th this is kind of the opioid crisis has kind of been the focus of my work over the last couple years, uh, particularly because it's such a big problem in Ohio. Um, and I, I titled the talk today, Demand Side Factors Influencing Endemic Drug Use in America. And I was uh, giving a talk several months ago and uh, someone from the Ohio Department of Health uh, came up to me afterwards because I used the the word opioid epidemic and and they said that we're we're transitioning away of using that term epidemic because it's no longer an epidemic it's endemic drug use and so uh, I'm trying to cooperate with them and and I think it, it is really telling um, and it is a better descriptive of what's going on in, in the United States right now is it's endemic drug use. Um, so with that being said, the other part of my title there is the demand side factors that are influencing uh, drug use in, in the United States. And so what do I mean by demand side factors? Well, 
as a, economists, we kind of have framed this problem and looked at um, the increase and in, the dramatic increase in overdose rates into causal factors, and we, and we categorize those into supply side factors versus demand side factors. So supply side factors, those are things that affect the availability of powerful drugs. So we all know that the, the big story with the pharmaceutical companies and how uh, they pushed to make uh, prescription opioids regularly available to a, a much wider range of the general population and uh, the, the impact that, that that's had. And on the other side of things, you have to say, okay, well, what is causing people to increase their demand for these deadly substances? So what are the, the demand side drivers? So the supply side drivers and are uh, things like, uh, like I said, you know, with the prescription, prescription drug pre, uh, prescribing habits of, of doctors and how those have changed over the, the last two decades. And here's a, a graph of just showing um, the, the amount of prescriptions. Let's see if I can grab my, my pointer here. So this gray line here is prescription drug rates. And you also see overdose rates from all drugs, this dark red line up here, and then overdose deaths from prescription opioids here. And so you can see as uh, prescription drug rates increased, drug overdose rates increased. This is a very familiar story probably for a lot of you. And that that was mainly driven by uh, prescription opioids. Now, there were some things that affected supplies. Uh, in 2010, there was a reformulation of OxyContin to make it abuse deterrent. So you could not as easily abuse OxyContin. And, and that was right here. And that kind of flatlined things for a year. Prescription rates kind of went down and overdose, prescription overdose deaths kind of went down. And then you had these other things, PDMPs, prescription drug monitoring programs. And basically all of those are is an attempt to stem the flow of prescription drugs. And they were really effective. If you look at prescription rates after these four kind of key states implemented them, uh, prescription rates went down. But what you see happened here is both opioid overdose deaths and overall drug deaths increased rather sharply. And so that's what we talk about when we're talking about supply side factors, things that are affecting the supply of dangerous drugs, primarily opioids in the system. And these are all oxycotton reformulation, the increase in prescription practices, prescribing practices, and prescription drug monitoring programs are all supply side issues. And that's not really the focus of my talk today, but I just wanted to kind of give you a contrast of what we're talking about when we're talking about supply versus demand side issues. Okay, so let's talk about demand side issues now. What are demand side drivers of this? Well, um, here's just kind of a, a broad range of, of things that could be affecting demand for these really potent substances. One, community economic disadvantage. Where you live determines how um, much opportunity you might have economically, and so that might be something that is playing into why people are using these drugs at a, at a higher rate. Mental health problems, there's been an increase in depression and anxiety over the last several decades, at least the, those being diagnosed, and maybe that's just a diagnosis uh, problem issue that's just showing up now that's always been there, but there has been an increase in diagnoses of anxiety and depression. Relational problems, you know, the United States is kind of founded on this idea of, of individualism and, and kind of, um, you know, uh, an independent, autonomous spirit. Um, but what that has kind of one of the consequences of that is that we are also one of the most relationally isolated and relationally lonely. We've become one of the most lonely cultures uh, in the history of the world. Um, and then finally, health conditions. So things like sedentary lifestyles, we all typically work at desks now. And so some of those things could be causing 
uh, an increase in chronic pain and that, that people are experiencing and so people are, are medicating. So those are all kind of demand side factors, things that would increase people's demand for really potent substances. The one that I'm going to spend most of my time on uh, because uh, it's my background is the community economic disadvantage. And so that's what I'll spend most of my time talking about with a, a nod to uh, some of the other ones very briefly at the end. Okay, so let's start talking about what's been going on in the crisis and, and how local economic conditions might impact that. Now, here's overdose rates by education level, and this is in Ohio in 2016. Now, um, the this really bright red line, line here is high school graduates. This dark red is some college. Let me get my pointer back out here. Uh, this dark gray is those with an associate's degree, and this lighter gray is overdose rates for those with a bachelor's degree. Now, um, we've all heard anecdotes of the high school football player who got injured and was prescribed some prescription opioids and got addicted or kind of the suburban college educated soccer mom who overdosed and died. But um, what this shows, and, and it's a little bit more exacerbated here in Ohio, um, but the, the same general trend follows for the, the rest of the United States, is that there's a wide disparity across education levels. And, and when, you, when you break down overdose rates, um, this is one of the, the demographic cuts that you can make that really there's there's a large difference over uh, different populations. In Ohio in particular, uh, if you have a, a high school degree or less, they're over that group's overdose rates are about 14 times higher than those with a bachelor's degree. So this real real large disparity between someone with a bachelor's degree and someone with a high school degree or less. Even just having some college, uh, there's a pretty dramatic decline in overdose rates for those populations. So it is concentrated amongst those with low population or with low education. Okay, so when you're thinking about how uh, the how economic conditions might be influencing the the opioid crisis and the drug crisis, you you think automatically most people the indicator that they think of is unemployment rate and you look at unemployment rates and what they've been doing the gray line here is uh, the United is Ohio, and the red line is the entire United States. And so you see, you know, we've been kind of before the Great Recession. Then you have the Great Recession here, spike in unemployment, and then it's been a pretty steady decline all the way through. And Ohio is probably pretty typical of of most states. So whatever state you're coming from, your uh, dark gray line here, your state unemployment rate would probably look something similar to that. Um, and so you look at this and you think about that and you think about, okay, what's been going on with uh, overdose rates over this period? And let's see if I can draw at all. No, I don't know exactly how to draw. But basically, with overdose rates, what we've been seeing is this steady increase upward. We didn't see a sharp dramatic reversal right around 2008 or 2010 during the Great Recession. And, and so you, you look at those graphs and you say, well, they, they don't actually match up. How, how can local economic conditions be driving overdose rates if, if those two things aren't kind of following the, the, the same pattern? And so what I want to point out is that, that unemployment rates mask a couple of things. The first things they mask is uh, differences in geography. So if you look at this map here, these are just county unemployment rates in 2016. And you can see there's some high places with really low unemployment rates. So these dark gray areas are low unemployment. And the red areas are really high unemployment places. So these yellow circles here. So you have Appalachia and kind of places in the south with really high unemployment rates. And then you look at the change in overdose death rates between 1999 and 2016, and you look and you find some of those same patterns. Okay, so here in the Midwest, you see a lot of 
the unemployment uh, rates were really low, and they also have low overdose rates as well. And then you look here in Appalachia, you see really high unemployment rates and really high overdose rates. Okay, but then you consider our other two areas where you know we talked about here in the Northeast, they had really low unemployment rates, but they have high overdose rates. And then really do down here in the South, where they had really high unemployment rates, but really low overdose rates. So what's going on? Even if you break it down, it's not geography that's kind of masking um, the a, a trend, a connection between local unemployment rates and, and overdose rates. So one of the other big things that they mask is type of job. So when we're talking about unemployment rates, the, 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 how we measure that as economists, there's a survey that goes out every month and they ask, do you have a job? And it's a yes or no question. And so they don't ask exactly what kind of job do you uh, have. They do, they ask that and they use that for, for different statistics, but not for the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate just says you have a job or you don't have a job. And one of the things that has been changing over the last couple of decades is the types of jobs available to particularly to kind of these middle skill workers in the United States. So here's a graph that shows you, um, that ranks jobs by their skill percentile. So down here on this end of the graph, these are low skill jobs. And up here, we have kind of college educated high skill jobs. And then on this axis, it's the change in employment over the last 20 years, basically, last 25 years, okay? So anything above this zero line, this red line, is positive growth. That means those types of jobs have been growing. And anything below this red line is those types of jobs, those, those skilled jobs have been declining over the last 25 years. So what we see here is that there's growth positive above the red line in the really low skill jobs and growth in the really high skill jobs and declines in kind of these middle skill jobs. So, you know, the, these are kind of like your college educated jobs and these are your jobs that might be like retail service, service jobs, things like that, working at a fast food restaurant, Re very low skill jobs. And these middle skill jobs were kind of a little bit more complex, like manufacturing jobs where you had to have some kind of skill level. And what we see is that the, the labor market in the United States is kind of becoming increasingly bifurcated or divided where you have a large concentration of low skill jobs and a large concentration of high skill jobs. And unemployment rates don't account for that, what type of job you have. And a big part of this story is what's happened with manufacturing over um, particularly the decline in manufacturing has been happening for the last 40 years, but really pretty intensely over the last 20 years. So we see manufacturing kind of was this slow decline from the late 60s to right around the, the, uh, the, the late 90s. And then right around 2000, we see manufacturing jobs just drop off a cliff here. And there's been a little bit of a recovery, but nothing in comparison to this, this sharp change in manufacturing jobs. And if you look at our four states that we uh, looked at before, Kentucky, Ohio, PA, and West Virginia with some of the highest overdose rates, you see that their manufacturing, and here this dark red line is Ohio, and this light gray line is Pennsylvania, had pretty sizable manufacturing sectors, and they saw pretty large declines in these middle skill jobs. Now, this dark line here is Kentucky and West Virginia, they saw sm pretty modest declines, but nothing like these sharp declines in, in Ohio and Pennsylvania. So what's going on? Is it just these manufacturing jobs? Well, Kentucky and West Virginia didn't have very high manufacturing sectors to begin with, so they didn't have a lot to lose, but they did have very large mining sectors. And that's a, a sector that kind of is middle skilled as well and has also seen large job losses over the, the last 20 years or so and, and longer. So where, where are these jobs changing? Here's just a, a, an example of Ohio's jobs. These are the top three. Uh, the, so the, these are the share of manufacturing jobs of, 
Ohio's total economy of total jobs in 2000 and 2015. And the same for government, retail trade, healthcare, and accommodation and food services. So you look in the, what this shows is that, yeah, manufacturing had this big decline. 5% of all total jobs decreased from 15% of total jobs down to 10% of total jobs. Smaller decreases in government and retail trade. So where are these manufacturing jobs growing? Well, they're going in growing growing sectors like healthcare and social assistance. So um, medical jobs, hospital jobs are growing, and that increased by three percent. So three percent of Ohio's total jobs. But you have to ask yourself: these people that lost their manufacturing jobs, you know, they might be kind of middle-aged. 35 to 55 years old, high school education, or maybe even less, are these the ones that are going to become a nurse anesthetist in, in 2015? Probably not. A lot of these people didn't end up getting retrained or, or going back to school to, to get into the healthcare industry. Where they ended up is the growth here in the accommodation and food services. So these are just kind of like your fast food jobs or um, other kind of low paying, low skill jobs. Now, now here's a you know, typical economist graph that looks super confusing and intimidating, but when you break it down, it's really not, not that difficult to understand. All this says is it plots out unemployment rates on this axis here, and then on this axis here, it has the job opening rates. So you're looking at any given unemployment rate in the United States, what was also the job opening rate? How many open jobs were there for at any given unemployment rate? And these different colors, so this gray here, and then the red here, and then the blue here, are different time periods. And so we see it, the gray lines here are the expansion in the early 2000s. And then the red is the Great Recession. So you can see as the Great Recession has gone on, the, the unemployment rates went higher and higher. But then the blue line is the recovery in, uh, from 2010 to 2016. And so you see during the recovery at any given unemployment rate. So let's say, you know, just take 8% unemployment. How many job openings were there? During the Great Recession, while well, there was about two, now during the recovery, there was about two and a half job openings. So at any given unemployment rate, we have more job openings now than we did in the early 2000s. So what that says is that even though there's job openings, that workers aren't able to fill those jobs. And part of that is a mismatch between the skills that workers have and the jobs that are available to them now. And that uh, is consistent with the, the picture that I showed you earlier and the split between high skill and low skill jobs. Okay, so all, everything that I've showed you so far has just kind of been descriptive. But um, the, recently there's, there's a working paper, a National Bureau of Economic Research working paper that connects these things with overdose rates. So you can say, okay, the, the, the descriptive story tells you, okay, that there's been a decline in job opportunities for kind of for these middle skill workers. Um, and that may lead them to feel like they don't have any job opportunities and that may lead them to despair and uh, 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 a, a more likely to engage in illicit drug use or uh, prescription drug use and abuse prescription drugs and overdose and die. But what this paper shows is they, they do some really nice statistical work and uh, they, can, they actually draw a causal connection between state manufacturing decline and increased overdose rates. So it's a really nice paper um, and it's publicly available on the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER's website. Okay, so what has been, been happening in the manufacturing sector that uh, employment has gone down so steeply but if you look at this this is output for the manufacturing and you know it's kind of chugging along and you see the the steep decline during the great recession but it's recovered again and so output is just the same so how is the manufacturing sector able to produce just as much as they did 
before the Great Recession as they did after the recession with so many fewer workers? Um, let me skip along. And, and the answer to that question and the answering answer to the mining question for, that's relevant to West Virginia and Kentucky is that this is increasing automation. A lot of those jobs did go overseas to China, but a lot of them over the longer period have been replaced with automation, particularly in mining, um, where you know coal mining is a, it's an immovable resource. You can't outsource coal mining, uh, but you can you can use increasingly sophisticated equipment to get the the coal out of the ground, and that's what happened in that sector. And so here's some work. Uh, that came out early last year that showed that in, in local labor markets, if, if you had one more robot per thousand workers, it, in, it reduces the employment ro population ratio. So this is basically a, 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 a easier way to measure an unemployment rate, something like an unemployment rate, um, or, or the number of people who are employed per population. So it reduces the number of people that are employed pretty substantially. And, and this is kind of contrary to the typical economic argument that uh, as technological innovation increases and, and continues to march forward, everybody's going to reap the benefits of those, those uh, gains in productivity. And what this paper kind of showed was that that's not always the case. When people have lost their jobs because there have been increases in automation that they haven't immediately got hooked back up with new jobs. And so there might be something different going on that, that is different than the, the past hundred years of technological advancement where people don't easily interchange between the jobs that they had and the new jobs being created. You think of the difference in sophistication between someone who was working at a manufacturing and auto parts manufacturing plant to the new jobs that are being created in Silicon Valley and computer programming. So there's a, a bigger gap there and that might be part of the story. Okay, one concerning thing is that we currently have 47 million workers with a high school degree or less in things like driving jobs or grocery store attendants, fast food counter workers. These are all kind of medium skill, at least the driving is medium skill, but these are lower skill jobs. Um, and these are all sectors that stand to be automated within the next five to 10 years. A lot of you have seen some of the, the stuff about uh, Uber and, and Google developing self-driving cars. Amazon opens a grocery store with no checkout. You just walk in, grab your food, and you walk right back out because it's all automated. So a lot of these jobs stand to be eliminated in, in the next five to 10 years. So what are we gonna do with all these, these workers that are out of jobs? The second thing that unemployment rates mask is labor force participation. So here's the labor force participation rates in the US from 1948 to 2016. You can see here during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, as women entered the labor market, large increases, but right around 2000, there's been this large decline. Part of that is baby boomers are retiring, so there's not as many people in the labor force, more retired people, but a lot, of, a large part of that is unexplained. And, and there's an economist here, Alan Kruger, who did some research on that and looked at the people who, the, particularly men who are outside of the labor force, and he found that men who were NLF, not in the labor force, express much lower levels of meaning and satisfaction to their day, in their daily lives than men who are outside of the labor force. But this was not so for women. So women who are outside of the labor force, they find meaning and, and you know, possibly part of that is just kind of long-term historical cultural norms and roles that women have been able to stay at home and care for the children and care for their family and feel okay about that. Um, but men, not so much. And another really fascinating thing that he found in his research in his survey is that half of prime age men who were not in the labor force were using daily pain medication. That's just kind of an astounding fact. So the, there seems to be this connection there between men, prime age men who are outside of the labor force, possibly because their jobs were automated or shipped overseas, and not finding anything that, uh, that, that 
that can kind of replace the thing that they were doing and not finding much meaning in their their daily lives. So this could be substantial. Um, in two point in 2016, 2.1 million people had an opioid use disorder, um, and this could account for up to 78% of non-baby boomer labor force participation drop. Um, and it could be up to 100% in Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia, where you had high concentrations of workers in those kind of manufacturing and mining sectors or, that, are, that are now out of jobs. Okay. So what are some of the consequences of this job bifurcation, the splitting of jobs into high skill and low skill and decreased labor force participation? Well, there's this story that economists like to tell, and I was kind of alluding to it a little bit earlier, that as productivity increases, everyone's better off. And we see that in the United States, that was true for a long time. Between 1945 and 1980, you look at these two, this thin blue line here is productivity. So productivity is increasing. And what's increasing right alongside it? Median real family income. So workers are more productive and their incomes are going up. And everybody's happy. Um, but what we see is that since then, these trends have diverged. Productivity has continued to increase with automation. So you have your output per hour increasing, but it's kind of separated from median real family income is flattened out. And so some people are really seeing these gains. College educated, those people that are really productive are um, seeing gains, but the median family is not. Another indicator of this is, uh, this is a graph from Raj Chetty's work who has looked at income mobility over the last 50 years in the United States. And this is a graph of the num the percent of children earning more than their parents by year of birth. So here are the birth years down here, and here are the percent of children that are earning more than their parents. You look at 1945, really high. You know, 92% of kids born in 1940 will end up making more than their parents. But you come down here to children that were born 30, 35 years ago, um, and where they're at right now, it's 50% and probably fewer than 50% now, even later, in later birth, birth cohorts that are making more than their parents. And so this kind of has a psychological effect because it's something that's pretty deeply ingrained in our culture to this expectation that things are getting better and my kids will do better than me. And that's what I, you know, will provide for them. And, and from the children's perspective, I want to do better than my parents. Okay, so again, a lot of the stuff that I've, I've showed you so far is just kind of a descriptive story, but there's been some causal research. Um, Alex Hollingsworth in, in 2017, along with his co-authors, found that that places that had higher unemployment rates also had higher overdose rates and he controlled for lots of other factors. I alluded to the Kruger paper earlier that showed that uh, men who are outside the labor force were um, using prescription drugs and uh, up to 50% of those who are outside of the labor force were using prescription drugs. Some of the work that I've done with uh, my co-author Lauren Jones is we looked at um, employment growth in, in local areas at different skill levels. And we found that growth in low and middle paying jobs were protective factors against overdose rates. So places that had uh, higher growth in, in those, those sectors that are employing um, low educated workers disproportionately, places that had growth in, the, in those sectors had lower overdose rates. Um, and then the, the Kofi Hurst and Schwartz paper that, that showed that manufacturing is a key part, state manufacturing levels, uh, places where they declined, you had higher overdose rates. Now, at the same time, you have uh, other papers that have showed that even though economic decline, local economic decline, is connected to overdose rates, it's a small proportion. So Chris Room here in his 2018 paper, he kind of pits these two supply side versus demand side arguments against each other. And he says that, you know what, uh, demand side factors, they do play a small part, but it's only a small part. The vast majority uh, of the increase 
in overdose rates has become is from the supply side, the increase in supply and in dangerous drugs. And the same with uh, Janet Curry's work in 2018. So um, I've to skip this. Okay, so our conclusions, they're pretty nuanced. Uh, on, on one hand, we, we do see that local economic factors are playing uh, a role, but they might be fairly small. And one of the things that's, that's interesting to look at um, against the supply side issue is just a solely supply side issue and kind of overselling just the supply side is when you look at all causes, leading causes of death of those under 55, this is the US and PA, these are ranked, drug overdoses are number one, but suicide and chronic liver disease are number two. So these things that have climbed up the charts, these causes of death, suicide and chronic liver disease, this, this chronic liver disease is from people who are, who are in essence drinking themselves to death. Um, those, those don't have anything to do with the supply of, of opioids in the system. And they've been increasing pretty rapidly. I shouldn't say they don't have anything to do, but they're not as strongly connected. And so we wouldn't imagine to see such large increases with that. Um, because of a, a prescription drug crisis. Another thing that's really interesting that I kind of want to point out here is when you look at substance abuse disorders and the trends over the last 15, 10 to 15 years, what you see here, these are uh, all substance use disorders. And you look at the rate of the total population with a substance use disorder, and that has actually declined over this period remarkably. And when you look at that, the decline has been almost entirely from those with an AUD, which is an alcohol use disorder. So substance use disorders have actually declined over this period, and it's been driven almost entirely by a decline in alcohol use disorder. So 2.6 million fewer people have an alcohol use disorder. You say, okay, well, what's what's going on there? That suggests that maybe there's the, the demand side doesn't play as much of a role because you have fewer people that are going to substances. Well, when you look here, you see these are different substances. And so, uh, you know, you have marijuana use disorder, green line is cocaine use disorder, blue line is prescription pain relievers, and then this this kind of yellow triangle line is heroin use disorders. Now that has saw a small bump up in 2009, around 2010. And so you see this ah, small increase. It doesn't look like much, but when you calculate out the numbers, it's about 230,000 more people have a heroin use disorder. And you think about, okay, what, what's been the increase in the number of people who have died? It's what, about 72,000 in, in 2017. And I think what has gone on is there's been this shift. These people that had the alcohol use disorder, a small portion of them shifted to heroin. And you don't need many people shifting from alcohol to heroin to uh, have a huge spike in overdose deaths like, like we've seen over the, the past two decades. Now, interestingly, if you look at... Um, this here, this is the, the marijuana use disorder. You don't see an increase in marijuana use disorders, but what you do see is a huge increase in marijuana use. So you have 10 million additional users using marijuana. Now, what that might suggest is that marijuana isn't quite as addictive as, or people don't have a disorder at, at the rate that they do with alcohol. So people have been substituting away from alcohol into marijuana, but it's not showing up in disorder rates. And, and there could be a lot of factors. Doctors haven't um, been trained to screen for that or ask about that as much yet because it's becoming legal and, and things like that. So there's some issues with recording and measurement. But it's interesting to note that you saw these this huge decline in those with an alcohol use disorder and also a huge increase in the number of people using marijuana as it's become more legal, but you didn't see an increase in the number of people that have a marijuana use disorder. Okay, so takeaways, U.S. drug crisis is more than a supply problem. Local economic conditions do influence overdose rates. 
And the coming automation is likely going to exacerbate that. Automation is only uh, growing more rapidly, and it's, it's affecting more sectors. And so we should be thoughtful about what how we approach that and, and how um, we think about that and we make policies regarding that because it is going to affect um, people's overall well-being and their health. Okay, so thank you very much. Any thank questions? You, if we yeah, have time. Yeah, we do have a little time. We have some, oh, a long question here from Allison. Okay, yeah. Childhood trauma, poverty, and educational difficulties are all correlated. Children who grow up in poverty and or experience multiple adverse events tend to struggle in school from an early age and are on a disadvantaged developmental trajectory that continues in their adult lives. Totally agree. Part of the solution is to invest more in early childhood. Two, not everyone wants to go to college or is able to be successful in college, and college is really expensive. Sometimes I hear and see people discussing college as the golden ticket out of poverty, but it simply isn't a realistic uh, option in many cases. Very true. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about these things uh, one at a time. I totally agree with the early childhood. Uh, argument, and if we go back to some of uh, you know my my policy thoughts, is these investments in education, and health, particularly in pre-K. So investments down the line, uh, when when workers are older and trying to retrain them when they're 35 and 40 years old, it's they're much less successful than getting kids into early literacy programs and in early pre-kindergarten programs. Uh, those have proven to be incredibly cost effective where you know one dollar in gives you about two to two to three dollars out um, so I'm a huge proponent of pre-k and, and totally agree with you on that one um, two not everyone wants to go to college I I totally agree with that and, and usually when I have more time I tell the story an anecdote about my brother-in-law who is a driver at UPS and he um, he went to community college for a year and a half and he has a learning di disability and he wasn't able to to graduate and it no matter how hard he tried or how hard he worked it wasn't going to be in the cards for him um, but he's a good hard-working guy someone that you think of kind of like your uh, your typical American middle class uh, work works hard for his family and through his job at UPS, he was able to buy a house and 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 uh, support his family, and it's a it's a really good job. But that job is probably going to be disappearing in the next five to ten years because of automation. We need to think about what uh, we're going to do with regards to that. So yes, I totally agree that um, college is not for everyone, and we need to think about and be very thoughtful. About with regards to what are we going to do if the large part of the population is unemployed because uh, robots have taken their jobs. And Okay, and then you have a third point here. Cultural norms and gender socialization absolutely impact men's social networks and their ability to find meaning outside of work. This is why dismantling long-held cultural assumptions and myths about gender is important not only for women's empowerment, for the well-being of all people. What would be the impact of raising the minimum wage? Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree with the, the the gender norms things. It seems like women have become comfortable going into the labor labor market, so you know they find they can find meaning inside and outside of the home. But the reverse hasn't been true for men. So more support for men um, being kind of the primary caregivers in their homes and 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 having a role inside their homes and, and shared responsibility at home definitely supportive of that so okay well while we're um finishing up here um we have a, an evaluation that we really appreciate your feedback on so please take a moment to do that uh, michael i was going to ask you about the percent change in some of these uh, drug use rates, alcohol use, or I think they were maybe uh, death rates. Um, if the it, these were in percentage change terms, so if the popu U.S. population is growing by say, I don't know what it is off, off the top of my head, I guess about maybe one percent per year. So if you didn't want 
growth as a proportion of population, would the rate and the, uh, those rates be about 1%? Is that how to read that? Uh, are you talking about the kind of the yeah, last, last graphs? Because they were in percentage terms. Okay. So if it, you know, if it's, you know, not increasing, but it's at 5%, well, that's a lot more people, you know, who are um, engaging in this that's activity right. relative to population growth. But if it's at 1%, then we're not seeing any significant changes, right, relative to the population size. Okay. That's right. That's right. Well, I, I uh, really appreciate um, you coming on. It looks like we do have one more question, and maybe this will be the last one um, that we can take for today. And of course, if you have additional questions, you can contact Michael directly. Yeah, and the question is, what do you know about the effectiveness of treatment for opioid abuse? From my understanding, the success rates are extremely low. Does this mean we need to think about proper oversight and regulation pertaining to these expensive treatment options? Yeah, I think that's something that we need to consider when we're coming up with solutions, policy solutions, um, is that currently almost all of our policy solutions and all of the money that has been uh, devoted to the to addressing the, the drug crisis has been for treatment and recovery. And that's great. Um, that definitely needs to be there. But uh, as uh, Barbara points out, that success rates are incredibly low. So uh, the the ones the the people that I've talked to, is um, the the professional medical professionals who actually administer treatment, they would say, um, you know, over the long term that there's an 80 to 90 percent relapse rate. Um, and heroin addicts that I've talked to have told me that once you use heroin you're a heroin addict for life, and it's something you're going to struggle with your whole life. Um, and so uh, how successful can these programs be? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think that, that that's something that uh, we should be doing all that we can to help people who want to get help. But the probably the bigger bang for our buck is going to be the prevention dollar. Um, so. In investing in edu education and health and pre-K, um, support for families, support for working families, expansion of the earned income tax credit, things like that. Um, but the hard thing with those is that they're they're really uh, uh, not politically sexy policy options because they take a long time to have an impact. If you're investing a pre-K dollar right now in kids, uh, hopefully with a, with an eye of preventing them from becoming an addict 15, 20, 30 years down the road, uh, that's, that's a, a long-term investment and politicians typically like to do what's uh, gonna have a quick fix so they can kind of show the success that they, they've had. So there's, there's a political challenge there as well. Yes, um, it's a challenge. Um, well, I think now is maybe a good time to close off the webinar for this afternoon. Thanks to everyone for joining. Michael, thank you for all the great information. Really appreciate it. Have a Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having have me. Have a good afternoon. Great. You too.